Hello, good afternoon. Uh, we are starting this uh, session today. Um, this is uh, Tris Siever, and uh, his topic today is lightweight web services with Pyramid. Uh, give him a round of applause. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I, I, one obligatory marketing thing, Agendalus Consulting is my company. Uh, Chris McDonough, Paul Everett, and I are all three of us former Zipcorp employees. Paul was a founder where I guess we could say we're recovering Zip addicts at this point. But um, uh, Pyramid is our sort of calling card, whatever. Uh, Chris McDonough is the primary developer on it. Um, so what I want to pitch here is that uh, you are working as a web developer at a successful startup with what is still primarily a 1.0 app, meaning you're doing primarily web development and not phone or, or otherwise mobile development. So you, you've been doing it for a while. You've picked Pyramid because it's small, fast, light, does what you need and doesn't make you pay extra taxes for stuff you don't need. And you built a nice, successful uh, site selling local sports tickets. Let's just pick something for right now because it makes so. Uh, Makes for a nice little local thing. Things are going well, you're happy with your app, scaling it well, and then you get backed into a corner by something that you didn't count on, like a lockout. So, um, so if, if in some cases, this kind of thing could be a killer, your revenue drops off, whatever. You might be looking for a way to actually try to take that as an opportunity in uh, you know, any, any crisis could be seen as an opportunity. And so in this case, um, we want a, a way to build an application, take, take your existing successful web application and turn it into a, mo into a mobile enabled um, API without having to rewrite things, change your platform, or otherwise pay a lot of extra price. And so I wanna show you how you can do that really easily. Um, because the, you picked Pyramid um, and followed a pattern that I'm gonna suggest that you follow, you get uh, a nice, easy, for free, almost for free thing for the back end, which means you can spend more time working on the, the new front end application. So Pyramid's job as a web framework is primarily to take an HTTP request and map it onto your code. Um, in this case, from Pyramid's perspective, a view is some function or other callable, might be in a class method, I mean an, an instance method, which takes a request object that the framework builds and gives it back a response. And this the classic hello world, you know, this is a, the response object here, you instantiate it with the body and you get it back, that's it. That's the sort of simplest possible pyramid application. But there's a way to make this into an even simpler application, which is that instead of returning a response object, you can give it back some data, a Python dictionary with some information in it, and then tell pyramid to render that data using a renderer, which might, which in this case could be a template. And so whether it's a chameleon template, uh, Jinja or Mako, uh, the, renderer is the renderer's job is to take that dictionary that you give it back and turn it into a response object. So your, your view code is no longer actually concerned typically with the de in, a, in an application like this, the, with the details of the, res of the response. You don't care about content type or transfer coding headers, you don't care about any of that mess, you just give it back the data, and then your renderer, which is your template or some other renderer, does the hard work for you, okay? And the reason that I suggest this pattern, and I'll, I'll, I'll show it here, this is the, the view code from the uh, sample that I had up there earlier. Um, this is all straight up Python. No, no web magic anywhere near this, right? There's, there's, the only thing in here is this is all about the data. And if you write your view code, I mean, there, there would be, in, in many cases, you'd have to pick something out of the request to find the uh, parameters or whatever you need, or if you're posting something, you'd still have to do that. But your, what you return is data, and the reason that that's cool is that there are more ways to render a response than just with a template. And in the, in the particular case that we're interested in, if you want to return data to a, a JavaScript application on a phone or other mobile device, the ideal thing to return instead of this HTML here that is, in, that is the, the template that was rendering those pages we saw earlier, the ideal thing to return is JSON. And I think I saw hands, although maybe not everybody was in the same room, I'm assuming everybody here is familiar with JSON, right? If you haven't seen it already, it is cool, especially cool for a pyramid, I mean for a Python developer because it looks like Python, you know? You, you can think about it like Python and you only have to kind of, you know, avoid a few cracks 
Um, none, for instance, but anyway. Uh, but here, what we've done to set this application up to return the web page is we took the, the, the function that we wrote and wrapped it up in a, a view configuration decorator that, mean, that mean, means something to Pyramid, and in particular says use the rend a renderer that's defined from that template. It's not actually the template, it's a wrapper around the template. But the renderer in the, in the, in the web app side, in the, in the HTML side, is, is built from the template, and you assign it to a route, which is the URL prefix that you would use. Uh, Pyramid offers another opportunity for spelling things if you don't like routes and URL dispatch, you can use traversal, but uh, this application is built around routes and, and URL dispatch. But you can also tell Pyramid that for some set of views, instead of returning a, uh, using a renderer that returns HTML from a template, just return JSON. And because, you're at, because your view functions are returning native Python data structures that map trivially onto JSON, you can actually use the same view function for two different views by telling, uh, by wrapping it, decorating it twice. So here we have to, I don't know why I had this backed up, switched around and uh, I missed it. But anyway, add another route so that, um, that, that you can tie, a views, views are tied to routes by name and so you have to add another one even though it has the same prefix. And then um, here, no, I, that's actually an error, I beg your pardon. I got, I got myself, there's, this route should actually have, as the path should be, instead of slash, should be something like index.json slash index.json. So uh, here, in, in, you'll note that I've decorated the same function twice. Uh, in Pyramid, the decorator doesn't do anything at, at import time except for scribbling some annotations on the function object. And then later on, that configure.scan and this function right here at the very bottom, that configure.scan, which doesn't happen at, at import time, but happens when the application object is being created. That's when the actual view objects themselves get created. So here you can decorate the same thing twice without losing anything because the annotations that are being scribbled by the decorator, uh, it's actually willing to take more than one of them. So that just saves up some additional information for the scanner to find uh, at startup instead of at, Im at import time. So I have two different <coughs> views here, both using my, my schedule function that I, we showed earlier. And now when you go to fetch that request, what you get is just, day, no, just JSON, and you don't write any new code. Um, so this is particularly useful. Let's say this is, this is a sort of poor man's web services. You're not actually writing a necessarily a REST API at this point. You're just saying, I know I'm going to need this same data, but I need it on the phone. I need it in JSON. I get it this way. There might be a little extra data floating around in there that might be interesting to the template, but not interesting in, in the JSON side, and you can fiddle with that if you like. But in fact, it turns out to be, you know, just straightforward to glue, th glue things together with the same bits of data. You do, you'd have to be careful with things. Um, you have to pay attention to when you're crossing over the curb to JSON, you have to pay attention to how date times and stuff work, you know, so you have to be, you know, you may have to wiggle back and forth about that. So it's not, it's not perfectly seamless because JSON isn't a perfect mapping for anything you can do in Python. But it's pretty close. And for lots of applications, this works just fine. So that's the, that's the simplest thing you could do is just go sprinkle through your application with your existing view code and JSON enable it. Um, uh, if you, need, you have more complicated needs, so if you actually need a truly RESTy API, where you, you want to manage collections of data um, and be able to do, you know, get, put, post, and delete on that as HTML verbs on the collection and, and fetch individual objects from the collection, then I recommend that you look at Cornice, which is a very thin and elegant layer on top of Pyramid. Um, Cornice is written by the Mozilla folks to run their web services for their sync and other operations. Um, it does two things. It, it, it sets up the stuff for the resty things, and it also lets you actually validate the input. If, uh, if a, a client is posting some JSON to you, you can actually spell the schemas um, for the input data using uh, uh, Colander, which is another uh, library that Chris has written for doing schemas. And then they'll actually, not only will they enforce those schemas at put time or post time, but they'll actually uh, introspect them when they generate the documentation for you for your web API. So you get a nice, simple, declare it once, um, document it for everybody API. Uh, 
a typical cornice service. Um, thank you. I'm actually going to be ahead here. I went a little quicker through my first part than I thought. A typical cornice service for managing a collection, you can write a cornice service using a bunch of view functions if you like, but there's a, there's a nice shortcut for using a single class to manage them called uh, the, the resource decorator. You decorate a class with the resource. Um, you tell it what the sort of route-like route path is for both um, the collection and for what uh, the sort of pattern path for an individual element within the collection. Here you see that the, the MID is the key in the collection and it gets substituted at runtime for you. Um, then your class itself will take, uh, again, you're, you're, you're still responsible for wiring it up, but when, when the get is called on the collection itself, the collection get method is called, similarly for post and, and um, put. And get is, a, is the sort of get an individual item thing. So Cornus sets up the routes and the mapping so that all that stuff happens for you. So you can write a, you can write a, a single view class that manages all the, the REST API for a collection, uh, including the individual items in the collection. So this is nice and small. Uh, it's well documented. It's fast. And it um, is very pleasant to use. Uh, I say I went through this a little quicker than I thought. Um, part of the trouble with trying to compress things down is you might over compress. I did. I actually cut some stuff out here, so I'll back up a little bit. Um, in the Cornus example here, I don't actually declare anything about the schema. But if you want to, you can actually tell Cornus to validate the input stuff for you. Uh, you can either give Cornus, and when you declare the resource or the individual um, views inside the thing. You can tell Cornus to validate for you, and the validator can be either a function of your own devising, or you can pass it through a validator that's generated from a schema. I actually have another client using Cornus, but they are, are stuck in the enterprise world, and so instead of using JSON for the payloads, they have to use XML. And so I was able to show them that I could take their existing um, XSD definitions for the XML stuff, convert them into relax, because it was a whole lot easier to enforce and then be able to use the relax schema objects to do the validation, both input and output. Well, always validate on input, do the validation on output for debug. And that took, it took almost no time. I mean, I spent two days on it to show them how to do it for their entire web API and their developers took it from there and it was uh, trivial. And I say they'd already defined all those, all those schemas so everything was nice and natural. All right, I'll take questions. Um, Sorry, I cut too far. I have a question. Ask away. So you're hosting sprints on Monday and Tuesday. Um, I am. It looks like you have about 10 people joining you. Do you know what you plan on working on? And can you tell the group what sprints are for those who sure. haven't sprinted before? Thank you. So sprint is a, is a term that came out of, actually, I don't know how many people would know this, but it came out of a, a desire that we had when I was at Digital Creations, Zope Corporation. We wanted to be able to experiment with agile techniques, but we were still tied up in a much heavier weight process for customer stuff. So we said, well, we're working on some new stuff. Let's just try doing very agile stuff for very short bursts of time. So instead of being the long distance running that the agile people talk about, we're just going to sprint. We're going to go do as much as we can possibly together in a room, be all in the room together, looking at each other, help each other out, pair program when we can. Um, so that was the initial sprints were actually, that were called sprints and not something else. I mean, the Scrum people were doing a similar thing back even before that. But the initial sprint for Zope 3 technology was actually in December of 2000. Um, so a sprint is a, is a place where people who want to work on a project are sitting together around the table. You can do it virtually, but it, it, the, it, the benefits tail off a lot. Um, sitting together around a table. Um, They'll sign up for one of a set of tasks to do with the project. They might, the task might be documentation, fixing bugs, implementing a new feature, pair where necessary. It, it really works well as a, as a chance to bring new people in the project. One of the reasons it's up three itself has something like 450 contributors into the, into the code base is that we used it as an evangelization mechanism. We took it around and had people come in. They could work with folks who already knew the code and could help them get commit access. Um, get set up and, and, and running quickly. So it's a great way to go learn a platform that you don't know yet. And, and whatever people are sprinting on here, I mean, that would be a great way to go learn an entirely new thing. You just think something's cool. You, it should work to go in the room 
if there's not somebody there who's willing to help somebody who doesn't know the platform yet, it's not really a sprint. It's just a hack. I mean, people are just hacking together, which is okay too. But a true sprint should be able to help somebody who's never actually committed a line of code to the repository before be able to sit down and do something productive right away. So that's the, that's the real goal of sprinting is to, is to let new people come in, get them productive so they can contribute. If they contribute once, from the benefit of the older guys who might just want to sit there and hack, if you can get somebody new to contribute once, they probably will contribute again and their contributions will be useful because they'll be working on things that you might not even think about. So sprints are cool. And I love the fact that the Python, uh, Python world just loves them. So. <coughs> And just to be clear, when I said 10 were sprinting, that's just for Pyramid. There's going to be about 30 people present on Monday and Tuesday, and I encourage you all to attend. And if we need more space, we'll find more space. Uh, I didn't answer your question about what we're going to sprint on. Uh, I, I have, a, I have a, a goal that is not a very easy one to share. Uh, that is to say, it's, I can tell, tell you about it. That's not a problem. But I'm not sure there's anything for anybody else that anybody else can do to help me about it. Uh, I, I'm working on porting the Zope object database to Python 3 because we use it for lots of, lots of pyramid projects, and it's the last dependency that our projects have. Everything else in pyramid is already Python 3, but we're still, for us, for the projects we want to do, I still need ZODB to be ported. So I am busy working on the B-tree support, which is a bunch of hairy C code, and so I'm going to be porting the C code, unless I need to be helping somebody else at a sprint, or somebody else has a, a really cool thing that I would rather, I'd really rather pull teeth than work on the B-tree C code. <laughs> But, but it needs to be done, so. All right, I think I'm done. I'll let you all go, thanks very much. <laughs>